Chapter Twenty Six North and South. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. Chapter Twenty Six Mother and Son. I have found that holy place of rest still changeless, Mrs. Hemans. When Mr. Thornton had left the house that morning, he was almost blinded by his baffled passion. He was as dizzy as if Margaret, instead of looking and speaking and moving like a tender, graceful woman, had been a sturdy fishwife and given him a sound blow with her fists. He had positive bodily pain, a violent headache, and a throbbing, intermittent pulse. He could not bear the noise, the garish light, the continued rumble and movement of the street. He called himself a fool for suffering so, and yet he could not, at the moment, recollect the cause of his suffering, and whether it was adequate to the consequences it had produced. It would have been a relief to him if he could have sat down and cried on a doorstep by a little child, who was raging and storming through his passionate tears at some injury he had received. He said to himself that he hated Margaret. But a wild, sharp sensation of love cleft his dull, thunderous feeling like lightning, even as he shaped the words expressive of hatred. His greatest comfort was in hugging his torment, and in feeling, as he had indeed said to her, that though she might despise him, condemn him, treat him with her proud sovereign indifference, he did not change one whit. She could not make him change. He loved her, and would love her, and defy her and this miserable bodily pain. He stood still for a moment to make this resolution firm and clear. There was an omnibus passing, going into the country. The conductor thought he was wishing for a place and stopped near the pavement. It was too much trouble to apologize and explain, so he mounted upon it and was borne away, past long rows of houses, then past detached villas with trim gardens, till they came to real country hedgerows, and by and by to a small country town. Then everybody got down, and so did Mr. Thornton, and because they walked away, he did so too. He went into the fields, walking briskly, because the sharp motion relieved his mind. He could remember all about it now, the pitiful figure he must have cut, the absurd way in which he had gone and done the very thing he had so often agreed with himself in thinking would be the most foolish thing in the world, and had met with exactly the consequences which, in these wise moods, he had always foretold were certain to follow, if he ever did make such a fool of himself. Was he bewitched by those beautiful eyes, that soft, half-open, sighing mouth which lay so close upon his shoulder only yesterday? He could not even shake off the recollection that she had been there, that her arms had been round him, once, if never again. He only caught glimpses of her. He did not understand her altogether. At one time she was so brave, and at another so timid, now so tender, and then so haughty and regal proud. And then he thought over every time he had ever seen her once again, by way of finally forgetting her. He saw her in every dress, in every mood, and did not know which became her best. Even this morning how magnificent she had looked, her eyes flashing out upon him at the idea that, because she had shared his danger yesterday, she had cared for him the least. If Mr. Thornton was a fool in the morning, as he assured himself at least twenty times he was, he did not grow much wiser in the afternoon. All that he gained in return for his sixpenny omnibus ride was a more vivid conviction that there never was, never could be, any one like Margaret, that she did not love him and never would, but that she, no, nor the whole world, should never hinder him from loving her, and so he returned to the little market-place, and remounted the omnibus to return to Milton. It was late in the afternoon when he was set down near his warehouse. The accustomed places brought back the accustomed habits and trains of thought. He knew how much he had to do, more than his usual work, owing to the commotion of the day before. He had to see his brother magistrates. He had to complete the arrangements, only half made in the morning, for the comfort and safety of his newly imported Irish hands. He had to secure them from all chance of communication with the discontented workpeople of Milton. Last of all, he had to go home and encounter his mother. Mrs. Thornton had sat in the dining-room all day, every moment expecting the news of her son's acceptance by Miss Hale. 
She had braced herself up many and many a time at some sudden noise in the house, had caught up the half-dropped work and begun to ply her needle diligently, though through dimmed spectacles and with an unsteady hand, and many times had the door opened and some indifferent person entered on some insignificant errand. Then her rigid face unstiffened from its grey, frost-bound expression, and the features dropped into the relaxed look of despondency, so unusual to their sternness. She wrenched herself away from the contemplation of all the dreary changes that would be brought about to herself by her son's marriage. She forced her thoughts into the accustomed household grooves. The newly married couple-to-be would need fresh household stocks of linen, and Mrs. Thornton had clothes-basket upon clothes-basket, full of tablecloths and napkins, brought in, and began to reckon up the store. There was some confusion between what was hers, and consequently marked G.H.T. for George and Hannah Thornton and what was her son, bought with his money, marked with his initials. Some of those marked G.H.T. were Dutch damask of the old kind, exquisitely fine, none were like them now. Mrs. Thornton stood looking at them long, they had been her pride when she was first married. Then she knit her brows, and pinched and compressed her lips tight, and carefully unpicked the G.H. She went so far as to search for the turkey-red marking thread, to put in the new initials, but it was all used and she had no heart to send for any more just yet. So she looked fixedly at vacancy, a series of visions passing before her, in all of which her son was the principal, the sole object, her son, her pride, her property. Still he did not come. Doubtless he was with Miss Hale. The new love was displacing her already from her place as first in his heart. A terrible pain, a pang of vain jealousy shot through her, she hardly knew whether it was more physical or mental, but it forced her to sit down. In a moment she was up again as straight as ever, a grim smile upon her face for the first time that day, ready for the door opening, and the rejoicing triumphant one, who should never know the sore regret his mother felt at his marriage. In all this there was little thought enough of the future daughter-in-law as an individual. She was to be John's wife. To take Mrs. Thornton's place as mistress of the house was only one of the rich consequences which decked out the supreme glory. All household plenty and comfort, all purple and fine linen, honour, love, obedience, troops of friends would all come as naturally as jewels on a king's robe, and be as little thought of for their separate value. To be chosen by John would separate a kitchen wench from the rest of the world. And Miss Hale was not so bad. If she had been a Milton lass, Mrs. Thornton would have positively liked her. She was pungent, and had taste, and spirit, and flavour in her. True, she was sadly prejudiced, and very ignorant, but that was to be expected from her southern breeding. A strange sort of mortified comparison of Fanny with her went on in Mrs. Thornton's mind, and for once she spoke harshly to her daughter, abused her roundly, and then, as if by way of penance, she took up Henry's commentaries, and tried to fix her attention on it, instead of pursuing the employment she took pride and pleasure in, and continuing her inspection of the table linen. His step at last! She heard him, even while she thought she was finishing a sentence, while her eye did pass over it, and her memory could mechanically have repeated it word for word. She heard him come in at the hall door. Her quickened sense could interpret every sound of motion. Now he was at the hat-stand, now at the very room door. Why did he pause? Let her know the worst. Yet her head was down over the book, she did not look up. He came close to the table, and stood there waiting till she should have finished the paragraph which apparently absorbed her. By an effort she looked up. "'Well, John?' He knew what that little speech meant, but he had steeled himself. He longed to reply with a jest, the bitterness of his heart could have uttered one, but his mother deserved better of him. He came round behind her, so that she could not see his looks— and, bending over her grey, stony face, he kissed it, murmuring, "'No one loves me. No one cares for me but you, mother.' He turned away and stood leaning his head against the mantelpiece, tears forcing themselves into his manly eyes. She stood up. She tottered. For the first time in her life the strong woman tottered. She put her hands on his shoulders. She was a tall woman. She looked into his face— she made him look at her. Mother's love is given by God, John. It holds fast for ever and ever. A girl's love is like a puff of smoke. It changes with every wind. 
"'And she would not have you, my own lad, would not she?' She set her teeth. She showed them like a dog for the whole length of her mouth. He shook his head. "'I am not fit for her, mother. I knew I was not.' She ground out words between her closed teeth. He could not hear what she said, but the look in her eyes interpreted it to be a curse, if not as coarsely worded, as fell in intent as ever was uttered. And yet her heart leapt up light, to know he was her own again. "'Mother,' said he hurriedly, "'I cannot hear a word against her. Spare me, spare me. I am very weak in my sore heart. I love her yet. I love her more than ever.' "'And I hate her.' said Mrs. Thornton in a low, fierce voice. I tried not to hate her when she stood between you and me, because, I said to myself, she will make him happy, and I would give my heart's blood to do that. But now I hate her for your misery's sake. Yes, John, it's no use hiding up your aching heart from me. I am the mother that bore you, and your sorrow is my agony, and if you don't hate her, I do. Then, mother, you make me love her more. She is unjustly treated by you, and I must make the balance even. But why do we talk of love or hatred? She does not care for me, and that is enough, too much. Let us never name this subject again. It is the only thing you can do for me in the matter. Let us never name her. With all my heart. I only wish that she and all belonging to her were swept back to the place they came from. He stood still, gazing into the fire for a minute or two longer. Her dry, dim eyes filled with unwanted tears as she looked at him, but she seemed just as grim and quiet as usual when he next spoke. "'Warrants are out against three men for conspiracy, mother. The riot yesterday helped to knock up the strike.' And Margaret's name was no more mentioned between Mrs. Thornton and her son. They fell back into their usual mode of talk, about facts, not opinions, far less feelings. Their voices and tones were calm and cold. A stranger might have gone away and thought that he had never seen such frigid indifference of demeanour between such near relations. End of chapter 26